welcome to another episode of Colubrid and Colubroid Radio. Uh, Matt's back. How you doing, Matt? Man, my legs are like jello after running those four miles, but I'm back. Clint called yeah. me even too just to see what was going on. So, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, my man Matt here ran four miles in forty minutes. So, you know, that's pretty damn. <laughs> that's better than me. I walk five miles in an hour and ten minutes. So there, there you go. Not but bad yeah, for no an old guy. <laughs> mm-hmm, not bad for an old guy. Um, yeah, but for old guys, we've been pretty damn busy as always. Um, but what, where, what have you been up to, and where have you been? In the past couple oh, of weeks, man. man. Well, you know, we, we've talked about, and, and part of the reason even bringing Clint in here, too, as well, is to kind of help out with my travel schedule as it is right now. But um, last week, I was in Detroit area, went to University of Michigan, did a talk there, too, as well, for the students in their engineering program. And at that point in time, on my way back on Friday, a candidate that I had interviewed for an open position in Detroit that's been open for a year and a half now, accepted our offer. So nice. extremely pleased to fill that position. Um, we're, I'm bringing another candidate in for another open territory this week. So hopefully we get the, the same turnaround. Um, but I got to tell our listeners, if you're young and you're applying for jobs, always send an email after <laughs> the interview just to say thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm blown away by generations of how much lacking of follow-up is actually occurring. Mm -hmm. Um, It's an extremely important part of the process, and I think it's something just as a little bit of feedback from these older guys. (laughs) You know, we do look for stuff like that. So, Yeah, no. uh, Well, I mean... I work with young people all the time. I mean, it's literally my job as a professor. So, yeah, we we tell our guys to do that. So hopefully they're doing it. But by all means, follow up post interview, man. That's that's like the most straightforward, logical way to let somebody know if you really want a gig is to just simply say, "Yo, I enjoyed the process. Looking forward to hearing from you." So that's sage advice from Mister Most. <laughs> yeah. Anything new going on in your snake room? No, nothing too new. Um, probably in the next two to three weeks, I'll start bringing up animals out of cooling. Um, you know, one of the things I did, and I, I hope people um, do take a look at, I did donate an exanthic mandarin to the herpeticulture um, fundraiser, too, as well, that they're raising mm-hmm. money for. Um, there's still five spots on that auction or however you want to call it in terms of the raffle. Um you know, obviously the money's going to a good cause. And if you know me, I, I try to do stuff with kids and really enjoy stuff like that. So definitely take a look at some of the open auctions that are still available. Yes. Um, Justin Smith's running that. So go to the THP website, uh, his webpage, give that a gander. There's some pretty good stuff there for a really good cause. So, yeah. Um, me, I had my frenetic two and a half weeks. I went to Florida. Played with indigo snakes at OCIC. That was pretty cool. Um, went to Norfolk for a crayfish conference, which is pretty cool. We're in the middle of the insane scheduling part of my semester, and incoming graduate students are being discussed, and just uh, all kinds of crazy. And I knew that this was going to happen, so I intentionally put my animals down a couple weeks later than I normally do, and I'm kind of in the same boat as you. Uh, and about two weeks, two and a half weeks, maybe three weeks, somewhere in there, I'm going to start bringing my animals um, up out of brumation. I, I planned it perfectly. This is the first time since 2006 I don't have a spring break trip, and I plan to just be home. So my guys are going to come up last week of February, kind of do that preliminary warming piece, and then move everybody to where they're ultimately going to be for the rest of the year while I'm on break. So that should be that should be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't really have much, uh, I have been breeding false water cobras. This is the time of year I put them together. Uh, yeah, I, I love false water cobras, but I think breeding false water cobras is about as easy as breeding crested geckos. You just, <laughs> you just put the boys with the girls and it's, it's on. Um, so, uh, I had, 
uh, you know, I, I didn't know if I was going to do it or not, but I thought, what the hell? So I have a, a lavender male, and I have two het lavender females, so from two different lines of those. So I, I put the the male with the, the the ladies. He's the he's the only false water cobra I have I have owned that decided eating really wasn't something he wanted to do. So he's only like four feet long and three and a half years old. My other male, same age, like six feet long, um, but. I think you got the job done. I was looking at the ladies this morning, and there's some ovulation swells going on. So we shall see. And then we have a really cool master's thesis using our false water cobras, or my false water cobras, uh, where we're going to be looking at behavior, uh, response, and if it's a genetic thing in snakes, which is pretty cool. Because some of my females are very calm, and some of them are satanic. And some of them are um, kind of shy, but because they hood, you can actually see that. So uh, we kind of anecdotally noticed that the babies the past couple of years seem to kind of have the behavioral response of the adults. So we'll see if that actually holds true uh, with this thesis that's coming up this spring. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. Um, but no, other than just running around like a chicken with my head cut off, uh, yeah, that's all I have. Um, I Welcome to my life, Zach. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't like it, Matt. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I live a pretty active, busy life, but when you throw into it perpetual movement across the continent, that adds a whole new level to it. Uh, but I do think we need to give props to Mr. Bartley. Uh, I listened to his episode with PJ, and he is a natural, so way to go, Clint. Um, and then... I just really enjoy talking to PJ. So that's one of my you know, favorite episodes we've had had so far. And then final thing, before we move on to our guest, uh, I had, we, we've, we've had some people reaching out about episode subjects. I have responded to every single one of them. Matt's responded to a few when he has the time to do so. And you're going in the spreadsheet. So I can tell you, uh, we will definitely be having um, some hognose snake specific episodes I'm diving into the hog book full steam in May, and I already have some people I want to talk to. So we're going to kill multiple birds with one stone. So there will absolutely be some hognose snake episodes coming up. Don't know if we'll do much with morphs, but we will definitely do a lot with husbandry because that's a snake where there's multiple camps as to how you keep them. And I'm really interested in, in that. So that's a little self-serving, but something we're going to do. Had another very loyal listener reach out and say, yo, you talked about a mite episode a couple months back. I think it'd be really worth doing. So I've already started gathering the journal articles. There are actually, believe it or not, quite a few on treating mites and snakes and the life cycle of Ophionysis. That's the snake mite. So I think that's something that we could definitely do. And I uh, look for that to drop probably April, May, when I get more of the semester under my belt. Um and then we had somebody ask about Madagascar ophis, which are the Madagascar cat-eyed snakes. That's actually a species that I have a lot of experience with. So, um, yeah. But if you're listening to this and you want a dedicated episode, reach out primarily on Facebook or Instagram. Just send us a message, and we we can check those. And I try to check it at least once a week. Uh, so, yeah, that that's kind of an update on shows where we're at, all that kind of good stuff. So any other little announcements, big announcements, just announcements before we jump in with our guest? Well, the one thing I, I haven't really touched on is, and I haven't sent a lot of pictures about this, is um, some of you know that I work with Rubidus too as well um, in terms mm -hmm. of Rebo. Um, and I do have a female that's actually right now in her prelay shed too as well. So I'm excited about nice. that too as well. So that'll be one of my, that'll be the first time I've bred those. Um, you know, some of my lineage comes from Stan Grumbeck and some of those animals are originally wild caught stock. And then hopefully next year I'll be bringing in another line too as well to actually cross into that from a fresh wild caught animal too as well. So Try and, and, you know, from some of the conversations we've had on here, too, as well, I mean, a lot of people know that I'm, I'm very big in terms of strengthening bloodlines and trying to persist in that nature. So we'll see what happens. But I'm 
I am enjoying working with some of the Kribos, especially as how they fit into my collection with temperature too, as well. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> I think you'll see, uh, some kind of side tangents happen in the future here too, as well. Yeah. No, we, we, we definitely need to hit dry market and like right on the head. Uh, I can, I'm, I, I took the, the two Eastern indigos that Tim Brophy donated to the university and yeah, there's, they're not even a year old yet. And, and I, I don't like the little snakes being here. I, I like to take the little ones, get some size on them and then bring them back to the school. So they're at my house and they have been a ton of fun to take care of. Um, and then going to OCIC and playing with, not playing with, doing research with <laughs> um, all those indigo snakes. That's been, yeah, no. Dry marking is definitely something we need to, to hit on. The, the Rubidus are the Mexicans, right? Correct. Yeah. 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 And no, Stan had Mexicans. some amazing, like, gun metal black animals and things like that. And, you know, I think as we, we go down that road to in future conversations, I think talking about lineage, animals, origins, um, I think will be very important to kind of discussing that species further. So, yeah. And, and we are absolutely going to address head on inbreeding in dry marking because we've had black tail Kribos here at the university and I've had some outcrossed animals that were great. And I've had some animals that unfortunately showed every clinical sign of being not just inbred, but really inbred, severely inbred. And, and so you going through the efforts to bring in multiple lines and, and, you know, bulk up that heterogeneity, that's, that's an absolutely admirable effort uh, because I don't think I've ever seen the effects of inbreeding quite as bad as I've seen them in the black tail Kribos we had at the school. I mean, it was, they were rough. <laughs> so anyway, okay. Well, Ready to, to segue to Dan? I think we jump in, man. Okay, this cool. kid This kid has like three hours of sleep, ready to roll. Yeah, exactly. He, he's Punching also from monsters. Philly, and today's the day of the Super Bowl. Like, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's doing the Lord's wow. work today. Um, so. I'm, I'm not worried about that game. I'm not okay. worried at all. <laughs> well, that's right. I think you – do you not honor the other side of the state? I, I do honor the other side of the state. Yeah. Um, but you have I gotta be taste, careful. My friend, that's my team. <laughs> so, anyway. Okay, cool. So our guest today is Dan Sheehan. Um, Dan is a lifelong, lifetime herper. Uh, he's with Root Scoots and Scales, uh, Herpeticulture with Herpeticulture, Jesus, which he does with his girlfriend, Stacy. Uh, and yeah. And today, we're going to talk about a, a genera that we have had many requests for. Um, we're going to hit on Boiga, because I think currently, Dan pretty much has, he may have more species in human care in America, than or North America, than anybody else working with Boiga. Is that a fair statement? If, if not the most, it's pretty, pretty close. Um, I keep losing track of how many I say I have because there's two species that aren't in my physical possession, but they are under my, my care and ownership, but they are, gotcha. they are mine. It's just, they're not here. So I kind of think about them sidetrack a couple of yeah, times. We, yep. Totally know about those. So Dan, uh, with our episode today, I do want to just throw it out to the listeners. Um, Boiga are a rear fang species. And they are rear fang species that not much is known about their, their venom currently. Uh, and so we are absolutely going to be hitting in on the potential toxicity and issues associated with being um, tagged by one of these guys. So if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, yes, uh, you got to – Matt and I are really big on making sure that everybody hears the pros and the cons to keeping these guys. Um, so we'll be hitting on that here in a minute. So at the very least, you know, stick with us to that point. But before we get to that, tell us a little bit about your history in herpetology, herpetoculture, kind of how did you end up where you are today? Um, so start of all of it, I grew up going back and forth between like just south of Philly and western PA up in the mountains. And uh, there's a picture floating around somewhere in my parents' house 
of me walking out of the woods when I'm only like two or three feet tall and there's a six foot black rat snake up on my shoulders and I just have this <laughs> biggest shit eating grin on my face. <laughs> and I think for my parents, it's been downhill since, um, <laughs> I didn't get to own anything outside of your occasional, like I bought a Knowles from pet store before I knew how to care for them. Uh, kept them in a 10 gallon upstairs and left the window open one night, got too cold and unfortunately lost them all. But, um, cycle around through high school, um, freshman year college, my best friends say, Hey, we're going to go to a reptile show. And that was beginning of 2012. And I don't think. I think I've missed like three hamburgs since then. <laughs> I'm always there. <laughs> but yeah, there was a uh, thing. And then if we want to get real specific with Boega, you know, I think everybody's seen the picture of the big melanota just gaping on a tree branch. that's probably been used as a stock photo in front of a whole bunch of different magazines, but walk into Hamburg and somebody's got a, like a 40 gallon tall tank with a stick. It just, you know, like look like a carpet, not a carpet, like a green tree python set up. Some people with just one stick going across and just big melanota just curled up on top of it. And I was just like, yep, that that's where I'm going one day. Yep. That's, that's it. <laughs> so Dan, I mean, what pushed you towards belubrids? I mean, and colubroids, I mean, Obviously, but we guys, you just kind of mentioned in terms of, you know, the conversation of what attracted you to it. I mean, was there any other substantial aspect of keeping that kind of pushed you towards that? Um, I think part of it was just kind of having been the local native stuff that I had, which like I got to see all the time, different colubrids. So that your rat snakes, your milk snakes, uh, king snakes, pine snakes, whenever I got a chance to go over to the pine barrens and finally find those. But I just like the active nature that they seem like they had more going on upstairs than the boas that I've had, the pythons that I've had. It was just something that if I am interacted with them, they would interact back with me, sort of. It wasn't just a, hey, I'm going to put you in here and I'm going to do some things and move some stuff around and see how you act and come in and then you're still sitting in the same spot I put you in, like, three hours ago sort of thing. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, when you start to look at different species, I mean, you have to have that interaction with it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's in, you know, for some of the Boiga, I mean, setting them up in natural terraria, I mean, watching their observations, I mean, that really is, you know, the aspect of the keeper and the kept, right? I mean, really understanding how to take care of an animal. Yeah, I think, I'm slowly transitioning like certain cages. I can't set up naturalistic because if you know, the goal is to breed and some of those, I don't have any clue of where I'd be able to find those eggs. If it grew into the point of where it would go, mm-hmm. like the fact that Roy can find his eggs in that giant enclosure of his for his sulfurous is impressive mm-hmm. enough to me. But like the ones that I do have set up naturalistic and have some UVB, it's, it's fun to watch the cryptic basking and, even during the day, since they are nocturnal, like you still, I go in there sometimes and I'll see them still moving around just in, just, just out of sight, you know, of the, of the lights and then the shadows. And it's just nice to see that. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, so with your collection, I, 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 I know you own things other than Boiga. So for our listeners, Dan and I have communicated and I, I refer to, Dan is my buyer to my wife. <laughs> That's what he's known as because um, he's made the pilgrimage to the university quite a few times. We've traded some false water cobras from me to, for other things with, with him. My Boiga Sienna, when I was like, okay, you know, I've, I've done what I can do with these. I've bred them. Um, I The first person I thought of is they're, I'm just going to give them to Dan because there's not a better person for these guys to end up with. Uh, so, you know, we, we have that history together, but – Tell tell the the audience just a little bit about what your collection looks like currently. Right. Just my personal collection, because if I go into what Stacy has and what we have yes. together, it's going to get kind of long. <laughs> Those things but, have um, legs, so there's that. <laughs> well, she's got a couple pythons and boas, but um, mm-hmm. we have I have a pair of northern pines, a pair of blacktail 
pair of yellowtail three bows. I'm a big fan of those. I have four false water cobras, four king rats, a trio of baron racers, a trio of rhino rat snakes. I go both sides. I like both of them. Sorry, Zach. Yeah. There is no superior. <laughs> okay. um, the uh, I'm trying to I'm getting lost in my own room here in my head. Uh, a couple of Madagascan giant hog nose that I got from Owen, and then a couple corn snakes. And I think I, I have three mandarins. Yes, I can't forget about the mandarins. I have three, but everything else in my eighty snake collection is all the Lega. I think it's up to thirteen species right now. So holy, yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so lots of rear fanged animals there. I noticed. Is that a was that a a theme that you went after, or just a serendipitous consequence of the animals that you like? For a while, it was serendipitous, and then it just turned into let me just keep looking at rear fanged species and see what fits the bill of my room, and it just kept un- unveiling new species to me, and it's like all right. I like that. That one's nice. All right. It fits the room. Just like how Matt probably keeps most of his stuff and he was having issues with his rubidius and keeping temps. I have one species that is outside of that norm and it's a Bolega species, obviously, oddly enough. But mm-hmm. everything is kind of all semi humid to tropical species that I've kind of just worked that way with. Gotcha. Cool. So, Dan, can you go into, you know, some of the specific species of Boica that you have? Yeah. Because, I mean, you mentioned, you know, the 13, but. So, the one species that, out of all the other Boica I have that does not follow the relatively same suit is a pair of Boega trigonata. I don't think they're the subspecies, the melanocephala, but they are common cat snake. Is there one of their scientific common names, but. The trigonata, as I call them, arid, semi-arid species, uh, North India. Their basking spot's about 100, and they are perfectly happy and content versus, you know, the cyanea that I have. Those were my first, like, kind of big collection of boiga. Um, I got a pair from my friend, actually the one that introduced me to Stacy. Um, he gave me his pair. But they're 88 degrees from my hot spot, about 75% bumped up to 100% humidity during sprays. Um, it's how I trigger them to breed as well. But it's – if you had to do it in an easiest way, it's fine-tuning, but start around like 85 degrees, and then you can ambient and go down to 70 68, I've had it touched a few times and haven't had any issues, but I try to keep it right around 70 for the low point. Um, live plants help with humidity if you have issues. Where I'm at, I'm right next to the Delaware River and ocean. It's 50% humidity almost all the time here, so I don't have too many issues with the humidity issues, but it's not like Florida where I go outside and it's soup. So. Yeah, and, and so... Besides Sienia and the um, species from India, what are some other taxa that you have? Um, the Boyga crepolini, the flat-headed cat snake, they're North China, part of Russia. They're, those ones kind of act like a mimic. Their heads really flatten out like a mock viper sort of situation. Oh, cool. Even in the like, normal resting position, they're just really broadly headed. Long slender species, kind of similar to dog tooth cat snakes, but they max out about four and a half feet. Um, I had the melanota. I do have two of those. One's a very special individual for me. <laughs> uh, there's the guanciensis, which is, if you didn't want a dog tooth cat snake that gets eight, nine feet plus, um, perfect example for that. Max out about four feet, long slender species, and they go reverse ugly duckling. They start out very, very pretty, bright orange eyes, and turn into like a muted gray, sometimes black, depending on the locality. And they 
orangish tan eyes when they're adults. The Gemisincta, the Suluisi mangroves, you know, same same thing depending on who you ask. Heavily striped, bright orange and yellow coloration that, that goes down the body. Photogenic mm-hmm. color change turned to jet black. Right now, both my male and female are in that ugly duckling phase of kind of tannish white off white banding and black and they get a nice iridescence both as adults and juveniles the divergence i have one of those he is a wonderful species um one of the subspecies of dendrodendro or mm-hmm. the indonesian cat snake um Bolega simonensis also in that same group as guangxiensis but a little bit more high strung always ready to bluff and puff I think we're going around my room in different order here. Um, I do have two Niagara steps. One's with my friend for now, and the other one, the male I have, is coming in. Um, and there it is going down. Sorry, I have to, like, map out in my room. Yeah, I got you. Uh, okay. The Boiga Lata Fasciata. Uh, I don't really remember their common name. I don't really look at their common names, so I can't. I'm not, cause I know some of them get mixed around, but kind of a little thicker body than the Indonesian dendrophila and thick yellow banding with black interstitials and alternates black and yellow, black and yellow. Um, but most of them it's similar care wise and a little bit of tweaking here and there. Cool. Yeah, the Latta fasciata are one of my favorites. Um, I think their the common name is Philippine mangrove snakes, though. I think that's just what they're classified as or common name is. Yeah, I know the the de- the divergence. They go. I've heard them called Philippines. I've heard them the Palilo Island, but some people mm-hmm. just say that's the locale. It's just at this point, most. People that keep Boega that look into them, they usually use the scientific name, so I kind of just stop trying to follow the common name. Yeah, all good there. So off of that, Dan, <clears throat> just kind of talking about that, I mean, were most of the animals that you acquired, are they captured born, wild caught? Because realistically, within this genus and, and some of these species offerings, there's not many people working with them. Um you know, most of the captive born stock that gets brought here into the States um, originates from two people in Russia, uh, Sergei Royabov and um, Tula Herpetarium with Ilya, who's the curator over there. Um, I know Jordan has imported a lot of the animals from those two specific people because those are the primary breeders of the Bowiga. Yeah, I a good part of my collection, like the... The the ones the one male Simonensis I have out of my reverse trio the Crepolini I think two of those are wild caught and two of those are from Sergey the Latifasciata one is from Danny Stark and one is from Sergey um, the divergence is from Russia as well the Sinea they're a mix of bloodlines from different people I have the one the two from Zach the Jordan Russell one and don't remember where you said the other one was from I have two that came from Satu and then I have two that came from another breeder in sorry in Europe but the Multimaculata that I have I forgot to touch about that one the Niger Sips the Cynodon well, the Benkulu incense that I have, another one I forgot to mention. Those ones are wild caught. The Melanota are both wild caught. Um, the Divergence, not the Divergence, the Dendro Dendro that I have that I, I sent off just because they're not as fun as the Melanota. They were all wild caught. Um, and I had some captive hatched animals as well. So it's a good mix. Um, I try to sort around and get a couple of different bloodlines, especially with the rarer species and different people. Just like how you kind of keep the bloodlines best yep. you can. 
Cool. So let's dive into toxicity, venom, and bites before we start talking about what it is to keep these guys. Uh, so all of us have kept Boiga here. Um, I think I, I've only worked with um, Sienna. That was it. I can't tell you the number of Pittsburgh Reptile shows, which the, the Pittsburgh monthly show is very heavy with the importer tables. And doesn't seem like I've seen many in the past year, but back 2016, 17, 18, every flipping show I'd go to, there'd be I, anywhere from five to 50 <laughs> mangrove snakes of various persuasions. And then the dog tooth cat snakes, um, you know, things that are either boiga or things related to boiga. Uh, and I just re- remember seeing people grabbing these things thinking, I don't know if you know what the hell you have in your hand there. So <laughs> let's talk a bit about um, venom. So I can, of course, do the nerdy piece. Uh, boiga venom has in it as an active ingredient, a uh, little biomolecule called a metalloprotease. And the metalloproteases are the exact same things that we have in most of the proteolytic venoms, um, they can have some, they can act on neurons. When they do that, it's really unique and, and weird, but most of the time, these are things that are going to be responsible for digest. They contribute to the digestive enzyme activity, not like in your gut, but they get into muscles and they break down muscle tissue and they cause great big hematomas and, you know, all, all the reasons why you don't want to get bit by a rattlesnake. A lot of those come from metalloproteases. Um, and those are definitely present with Boiga. Uh, they also have acetylcholases, which acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that enables your muscles and neurons to work. So that's in their, their Duvernoy secretions. So that, you know, this isn't just spit. <laughs> There's definitely some biochemical active ingredients therein. They have the big enlarged fangs in the posterior part of their mandibles. Uh, sorry, their maxillary bones. So um, they can definitely bite. The the big difference, like all rear fang critters, is that they rely on um, the secretions going down a groove on the outer margin of the back teeth that are enlarged. And so it's not a very effective delivery system. But that certainly doesn't mean that you can just treat them like a freaking rat snake. So that's my piece. Now, when I had my green... Uh, green cat-eyed snakes? Is that what Sienna's common name yeah. is? Yeah. Um, I just didn't work them without wearing a hoodie, and I had on a pair of gloves, and they were the only snakes other than my bear and I where I would kick my kid out of the room and be like, Colin, you're out, like, lock in the room. And I basically treated them like they were freaking elapids because I didn't want to find out what the hell they were capable of doing. Um, and I never did because I never got tagged. We did – I did get – a clutch. I think I only had one clutch. Uh, and some of those little guys did kind of tag me. <laughs> um, cause they're sassy little bastards. But, um, I had like very mild pins and needles sensations. But with those adults, they might as well have been mambas as far as I was concerned. Cause I just did not. As soon as I learned about the metalloproteases, I was like, I'm out. Um, these things are, I'm not getting bit by one, but unfortunately. <laughs> The other guests here don't necessarily have the same experience as I. So let's who, – who wants to take it from here? So I can jump in. I mean, just in terms of conversation, um, for some of the people that know about my background, they know that I've worked with a number of venomous species just during graduate school. Um, I've actually milked Boiga, too, as well, with capillary tubes and mm. actually did a lot of work. Uh, respective of the rear fang aspect and delivery system for uh, their venom. And they are a very interesting species, but as part of that, you know, a lot of the images and pictures that we see of people free handling them, especially wild caught animals, they're very docile, right? Is what we're depicted as. Um, And I think part of that is, you know, you're getting animals fresh out of a bag that are highly stressed, dehydrated, have a high level, um, too, in terms of parasite load. And as a result, they're calm. But when you take a um, Boiga melanota 
and get a phone call from someone that has a, a four foot long animal that has to be rescued and you take it on site and you deworm it and treat it for parasites and the thing becomes the child of Satan afterwards <laughs> because now the animal is healthy. Um, I've actually had some bad bites from Boiga as a result. And that was even with using proper handling techniques in terms of also using hooks, um, pinning animals for treatment to, and anyone that has ever worked with venomous, it's not a matter of if you are going to get a bit, you will get bit in some aspect. Um, and uh, I have freely talked about that even too, with some people in terms of some of the handling of venomous animals that I've done in the past, because I've worked with King Cobras. I've milked all kinds of stuff over my time in graduate school. And I've had some close calls too, as well. Um, so it does happen. Um, no one that works with venomous is, you know, formidably not going to get bit. Something's going to happen at some point in time. You could be the most careful keeper and something could happen. Um, it's just mm -hmm. something you have to be cautious about. Make sure you have preventative measures to in line. Um, but in terms of some of the bites that I've received, I've actually had and received some of those hematomas in terms of reaction. Um, I've even had to the point where I've actually lost sensation in my hand um, and has actually blown up, you know, and, and this is true too of hog nose as we can talk yep. about in heterodon in the future. The reaction and how that venom is actually, you know, put into the human body and the system does react differently, and it also depends upon the dose of, that's actually, you know, received by that individual. Um, someone that might be prone to bee stings um, and rea heavy reactions from that, I'd be more cautious about Boiga, right? And even in some of the literature, when you read about Boiga, we really don't know a lot about venom here either. And that's something just we should be precautious in terms of how we actually perceive this and how we actually work with animals to make sure that we are at least doing it in a cautionary level versus just grabbing that animal like it's a corn snake. So. Yeah, I, I can definitely agree. There's, I think depending on the species, it definitely has different levels, like the cynodon, the dog tooth cat snakes. I think that I've kind of stopped remembering things, but there's a group of four boega that are really closely related in that cynodon group. I forget how they separated out, but it's still boega, but it is the Blenculoensis, the Multimaculata, cynodon, and the Guangsiensis that are all closely related. I've taken a tag from about an eight foot cynodon female. I was packing her up to send to a friend. This is back when I constantly changed my collection all the time, but I kept coming back. Um, you know, when you're trying to bag up an eight foot snake, because a deli cup's not really an option at that point. <laughs> no. Um, I need a little bit of help and nobody else in my family is into snakes, but there was hooks, you know, relatively placid snakes, dog tooths are for my experience. And unfortunately, as she was coming back up out of the bag, my dad grabbed about a foot behind her head because he tried to stop her from coming out of the bag. And I ended up getting tagged. I think within 20 minutes I started vomiting. It was, she got me right on my left thumb and just clamped about 10 seconds before she came off. Um, that one about 24 hours. I just felt like absolute um, <laughs> yeah, <You're not> vomiting, <laughs> fever, sweats. Like it was it's like that 24 hour bug that you never want to get ever again. Um, thumb definitely swelled up and had a little bit of soreness trying to move it around, but you know, came back to size within 24 hours. Um, not me personally, but I've had my friend Brian, he that has my nigerceps took a tag on his finger and that one swelled up and he basically lost part of his tattoo that he has on his middle section from the hematoma that formed from the nigerceps bite. And that was a, a bite response through 
accidental tongs and it just went right up around the tongs basically because it corkscrewed basic um and latched on and thought it was hey this is my dinner tonight so it just chewed away um and on the flip side of that um zach's talked about those importer tables and that's kind of how i got my real start into going to shows and everything i've had four dendrophila latched to my arm and the only thing that happened is i got a little itchy uh, fresh wild caught animals, it's definitely not something I'd recommend doing, but it's definitely a range of reactions that you can have depending on A, the species, and B, just your personal reaction to them. Like, if you're sensitive to bee stings or anything like that, I definitely would take a lot of caution. Even with tools, there are, all of these are arboreal species, they will climb that faster than you can think about it. Mm -hmm. And if they are not in a good mood, they will not, they will let you know very, very quickly. (laughs) Yeah. And and one thing I've noticed about this group is they are completely different animals. If you're working with them with the lights on, and if you're working with them with the lights off, I don't think in my experience, I've had a more nocturnal snake than the Sienna, uh, and I, I distinctly remember I was having problems with my pair eating. And I went on to the old King Snake forums, which are still there, found the Rear Fang forum and just read. And there was a guy that put up a post and basically said, try offering food at night. You'll get a completely different response. And I don't think there's been a bigger understatement in the history of herpetoculture because those <laughs> Deanna showed no interest. I mean, I was drop feeding them all the time. And that was the, they took, They'd gone on a month and a half hunger strike, which really didn't bother me that much, but it was starting to get a little worrisome. Both of them just, like, annihilated the mice by presenting them at nighttime. And I wasn't lackadaisical about opening up that. You know, they were in naturalistic vivs. Um, but that Nigrasub situation you talked about, uh, I mean, they were coming after the mice like, insane snakes and they were missing the mice and I had to like re adjust the, the mouse to make it so they'd actually hit the damn thing. Um, so I could see where even if you're being super careful, if you're not cognizant of what the hell's going on around you, you could, you can take a bite and then you don't want to deal with that. My, my mentor, cause I, I do get trained with working with venomous snakes and everything. I he one of the first things he taught me when I started helping him feed the collection was, Never straight in. Always have your hand off to the side, angle. Don't don't make it easy for it to come in and get you. I follow that same procedure when I'm tong feeding. Most of my belega, I think the only ones that will tong feed for me on regular are the nigriceps, the cyanea, the divergence, the laddies, and the gemisincta. All of the more thicker-bodied species for me have always been no issues getting them to tong feed. The more narrow, slender species, they're just too wiry. You think it's only like three feet long, and the next thing you know, you pull it out, and it's four and a half feet long, and you're sitting this, you know, foot out in front of the enclosure, and it's like, whoop, and you're like, <laughs> yeah, I probably shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, they got reach. Our, yeah, the arboreal snakes are the ones that, man, they're special. Okay, so well, anything well, else? even kind of brings in like our next kind of topic. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, really kind of a deep dive into husbandry, I think is really kind of, you know, perfectly in line with some of the feeding aspects because how you keep these animals makes a big difference in how you actually approach them too for feeding. So, you know, Dan, I mean, in, in terms of how you keep these animals, I mean, I imagine you're doing a little bit of racks or using a little bit of caging um, or maybe you're just deep dive all the way in. So, but I'm going to turn this over to you to talk a little bit, but I think in that conversation of husbandry, talking about substrate, how you set up animals, naturalistic in terms of providing even to comfort aspects of, um, hide spots, you know, what, what's kind of your typical approach, especially with establishing some of these species. Um, so I've learned very unfortunate hard way do not keep boy in racks i know some people can do it 
I would highly, highly, highly recommend against it unless you are basically making a cage inside that rack. You have high ventilation because you need that humidity. They need the humidity, but you can't let them sit in it. They will get an RI almost instantaneously. But I've also found if you can keep the, if you can get A, up the ventilation back up, get on on heat and make sure there's a big enough dry out time. Most of the time you don't need to intervene with any sort of medication or anything. As long as you catch it in time, you might get a little like in the winter here. I do get a little bit of a whistle sometimes from some of my snakes, but it's not, it's more or less I'm letting them dry out too much because of my room heater or anything like that. That's kind of, maintaining that ambient but even the smaller ones like I, my baby cyania that i've bred there i've done them five different ways now and i think the way that i have this one that i have now left set up is where i'm going to stack with but um dw geckos or terraria they make these little like eight inch pvcs mm-hmm. they're eight by eight by like six and they work wonders for keeping individually if you want or if you want to, if you can keep track of it. Um, I think PM Herbs has a like a 12 by 12 by 12. I don't like the Exoterra's too much ventilation on top. It takes, and then you try to play this game of trying to seal off pipe oh, yeah. the top. And, um, but the PVCs always seem to work well for me. That's where 90% of my Boyega are in. I have two in glass cages. The Trigonata are the two that are in there. They're both separated out, but because they're opposite side of the spectrum. But the substrate for them, it's either topsoil mulch mix, straight cypress mulch. Um, I have a friend that does dirt, like he does a special blend for, I think he mostly uses them for ice pods, but I use that as well. Um, you can mix in some sand in there just for some drainage. The longer term established animals, I usually just toss in some pothos because it's easy for me to grab mm-hmm. clippings from somewhere else. The one pair of cyania, I keep rotating out the male. Um, they live in a four by two by three enclosure and it is so densely packed that I don't think she could find him if she, if he wanted to hide from her. Um, but it's one of those. Most of these species, 90% of the time, unless you're breeding, keep individually. Um, I haven't had the issue of cannibalization, but it does happen, um, especially with like your melanota and your divergent or dendrodendro divergence. The whole dendro complex, from what I've been told, has had issues. Um, I've had a friend, a male gemisinct that got killed by his female because she latched onto his head and just clamped, I think actually got basically lobotomized, which was not fun. Yeah. But um, breeding-wise, I don't – for us, there isn't really a season. You can – most of the time I plan for the winter because we get a lot of low-pressure systems. That's usually where I use the trigger and just spray the ebbing living crap out of them as much as you can for me. That's what's had my most success. Um. So do you do any kind of, with that winter breeding, cycle feeding at all? Or do you, I mean, they're, they're, they're tropical, semi, yeah. subtropical, so they don't really have the same seasons that our temperate colubrids do. I definitely like Or no. It's, it's more pay attention if I see kind of the activity. Like, I do handle them, you know, frequently because I am shifting animals around to see how receptive they are. And usually when my males are really in the mood, and I usually take them as the main cue, um, I've had sperm retention. So it's like, hey, if I can get you together, I'll get eggs and I'll start watching the female for cues. But uh, the males, I call it wacky tail syndrome. They just, <laughs> you walk by them and it, the, everything from the back third of their body is just wiggling all around. Um, they do the jerky dance on the hook. They're like, hey, this is something. This is kind of cylindrical. Like, see what's, what's going <laughs> on here. Meet with the hook. <laughs> um, but the big thing for them and most of the species is birds. There's actually a paper that showed during the breeding season for our cyania that are in the wild. It's 
90% of their diet in that time frame of breeding is birds. Interesting. That's just cool. constantly birds because all the seasonal uh, migration that comes through and it's just a huge uptake in nest rating and constant activity. Usually if I see my female constantly roaming and roaming and roaming, I take that as a sign like, Hey, she's probably, she's probably got eggs forming. Start hitting her instead of maybe two mice this week. Um, hit her with three chicks this week. Cause I kind of bounce back and forth. I have a few that will only eat chicks and a few that only eat mice, no matter how much I try to get them to eat bird. But it's Dan, off of that, just out of curiosity, do you do any calcium or vitamin supplementation? I haven't done any personally. Um, I've, I definitely try not to keep targeting the same female so I don't have that depletion. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than just, I have done one, um, calcium, so like liquid calcium and water and soak just once. Um, so the one time I had a bunch of slugs come out and they looked like partially calcified eggs. So I was like, it's probably something I gave her a year off and she came back and dropped another clutch for me and it was perfectly fine. I don't know if it was just the time break or if it was that soak in that calcium, liquid calcium and water dilution that helped. Um, it's not something I kept track of and I probably should have. I'm not going to lie. Um, but the other thing is with them, and I think where supplementation might come in handy is every single time I've bred them, I've gotten two clutches. Right yeah. around the hatch date of the first clutch is when the second clutch comes. So that 110 day period, you know, even after she drops them, I think Zach might, I don't know if it's natural or if it's Zach's problem that he has with his false water cobra sometimes where you're trying to bulk feed back up to get yeah. them to recover from that. And they say, think that is, Hey, I can drop another clutch. Um, and I've kind of pulled back on feeding the one time cause I didn't want her to double clutch and she still ended up dropping the same amount of eggs the second time, which was 11. Um, so it was, I think it's kind of natural for them too, if they have enough food and it's just going to happen no matter what you do. I think that that's something that for these snakes that don't have to go into a winter torpor and they're out in nature. I, I've talked about this before. I wrote about it in the book a lot. Um, when they're living in human care and we're just, like you said, hitting them with mice and chicks and everything else, every, every breeding season for them in our vivariums is like the absolute best breeding season they could possibly have out in nature. So uh, with that resource potential going through the roof, it makes total sense evolutionarily that they may be pre-programmed where if you're having a good year and the prey's booming, let's drop another clutch because we're going to have high recruitment. But unfortunately, I don't know how great it is, like you were alluding to, for the animals themselves if they do this like every freaking time that they breed. Um, but no, I've, I've I've gone down some pretty nerdy rabbit holes uh, with this, and I've actually found mm-hmm. out that it's not just, you know, my xenodontine South American snakes, um, but it, it makes total sense. Boiga does that. The, the one season that I bred those Sienna that you have now, they double clutch. So, and it was same deal. Uh, I was in such a frenzy to get the female back up to weight that she got there and then dropped more freaking eggs. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I, I will say though, it's, it doesn't look as dramatic, like body drop wise. I don't weigh my snakes. It's more of just a kind of hands on feel, visual look. Um, but some of those more slender species, like the Maltimaculata, the Benkuensis, the Guanxiensis, and the Crepolini, you can, you can have one, like I've had wild caught Maltimaculata that come in, they look perfectly fine they keel over and there is not any sort of body mass to them at all. And you, if you feel them, they feel like air and that's more of my trigger. Like, uh, yeah, you probably need to get fed more often. Some of those species, like I think the Maltimaculata, 
I feed her the one that I have about every four days. It's a small meal, but those lankier species, I feel like they have a higher metabolism from what I've experienced than, say, the cyanea, the melanota, the latifasciata, the virgins, which have they have mass to them, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, but when you get those species that are constantly kind of puffing in and out and it's really hard to tell, it's more of a, a hands-on check every once in a while is definitely going to be like, hey, I definitely haven't been feeding you enough. You look fine. You're not dehydrated. You don't have wrinkles, but it, they're just constantly puffed out and just full of air. So on that, they look fine, don't have wrinkles. Let's talk a little bit about hydration. Um, I noticed that my Sienna, would they drank like it was going out of business. Um, do you – have? It, has your experience been that these things need a lot of water in their lives? Um, or was that just a one-off with me? Because, I, like I said, I've only worked with the one species, so I don't claim to be an expert at all. Um, every single one of my species know – where the mister is in, my, in their cages, they they get automatic mistered, and then I also go back through and I'll do heavy misting, more direct if I see them out because I usually check them right before I head out to work, and it's it looks like they've never seen water in their life. They will just <laughs> chug and chug and chug, um, and you've probably seen it where you get slightly wrinkles in the scales. You know they get that neck wrinkle on the side where they just haven't had enough water recently. And I'm not saying it's, you can't get away with going four or five days, you know, go for a small vacation and, you know, worry about your snakes dying. I don't think that's the issue, but they definitely, definitely will use moving or fresh water. They spray down on the sides. They'll drink off their scales. They'll, they'll do that a lot more than drinking from a water bowl. So it's definitely one of those things you still want to stay on top of when you keep them. Uh, for fresh imports, they're going to be high strung when they're inside their enclosure. After you get them set up, they are going to smack their face against glass. Um, you know, so like the melanotas that I had, both the special one I have and the, the male that I got for her, um, cover the front of it with black paper and just leave a little slit so you know, because even walking by, you can hear them kind of smack their face every once in a while if they were already out and kind of caught off guard with it. But with those soaking, spray them down and keep them in a well-drained enclosure, and that is your best bet to get them going. Don't worry about feeding first. Hydration is definitely your major priority when anytime you get any wild cobalega. So then for enclosures, just to kind of sum this up a little bit, we're, go, we're you're going primarily with PVC enclosures uh, because of, you know, with an XO, you've got a little bit too much ventilation. PVC has the right amount of ventilation. Um, inside the enclosure, we have a, a mixture of substrate that's going to hold humidity but not be mud. Yeah. And then we're going to basically add cage furniture to the point where there's a lot of pothos and basking logs and branches and, and things like that. Um, and then water... We have standing water bowls, and then talk a little bit about this misting system. Is it basically like a typical misting system you would have for lizards, or is it a like yeah, chameleons or something like that, or is it? It's um, the misting system for them that's hooked up to them. It's once in the morning, once at night, just a heavy about thirty seconds. It's one of the um, mist king systems. Yeah, um, nozzle set off in one corner. For the smaller cages, the two-foot cubes, and the bigger cages have two, one on each side to spray in towards the middle. There's plenty of space for them to get out of it where they're not getting directly soaked, so it's not a constant. If they don't yeah. want to get wet, they don't have to. Uh, plenty of cork hides, tubes mostly. They will they will fit in surprisingly small tubes for large snakes. <laughs> and most more tactile sensation they have on the sides, the better. Um, don't force them out of it. Let them come out on their own. But um, the mist, then 
standing water bowls in there. I change that out every four or five days. If I see any kind of film on it, like I'll get algae because of live plants. Mm-hmm. That happens on occasion if the leaves dip down into it or whatnot. Um, that gets changed immediately. But um, for heating for them, didn't touch on it too too much. I don't have – most of them are radiant heat panels with UVB and then the uh, the Jungle Dawn LED lights from Arcadia. Yeah. And the two-foot cubes that I have, they actually create <laughs> – a really good ambient, um, vertical ambient to, um, higher heat near the top. It's about 85 and then they can low, lower and raise themselves to get back and forth and it'll keep that nice standard mid seventies. And at night when those lights go off, it'll still retain some heat up top and then the lower end of their enclosure will get cooled down. So are, when you're heating, this is a question I have, or is it, are, are the radiant heat panels in there more to keep a constant low temperature and you're relying heavily on the lights or are the radiant heat panels the primary heat source too? The, ra- the radiant heat panels, they're the primary heat source in several of these enclosures. Um, they maintain a higher vertical area where they can get that large amount of heat. The UVB is still in there. It's usually spread out across the enclosure, so it's not one spot where you won't see – so it's more or less, if they want to get away from it, it's more go further back into the enclosure. And then the UPB, if gotcha. they want it, they come out towards the front. Um, still with a decent amount of cryptic basking between the pothos and the different pieces of wood and everything where they can kind of get in and out of it but feel secure. And the LEDs are, they'll generate some heat in the larger enclosures, but the, yep. the smaller enclosures without no radiant heat panel, and I haven't had any issues with that, just going straight off of that Jungle Dawn LED and just creating a vertical gradient from top to bottom. Cool. So hey, these Dan, are definitely just... not sterile enclosures with paper and sticks. <laughs> like, like, is that fair? Oh, it is 100% fair. Even, <laughs> even wild-caught ones if you give them that naturalistic setting where they won't feel as removed, like you can use cypress mulch or something, but thin layer on the bottom, just so it's not, you know, easy for you to clean and replace since they still have that bio load that if you keep letting them poop and not clean it, it's just going to proliferate to the point where you're going to have an issue internally because their parasite load is just going to skyrocket. Yeah. But it'll let you have that clean it, but it'll still give you that, relatively okay hey this kind of feels normal this isn't too bad i'm not in a white box with paper towel and sphagnum moss trying to figure out how to live i got you so dan one of the things that um i think when we talk about fresh flowing water and aspects about that with keeping specific animals have you noticed any issues in your time of keeping boiga in terms of health related to mouth rot or anything that as a new keeper keeping this species should be precautious about or at least know about in, in terms of fresh water, making sure the bacterial load isn't too high in terms of some of that water quality? So I've had four snakes get mouth rot and just the leg of were the only four that got him. Um, <laughs> And I don't know if I can attribute it to like standing water or water bacteria. Um, but a lot of the times that I've gotten them, it was, it almost presented itself like an infected tooth. Um, okay. you'll kind of start seeing like a kind of looks like a cleft lip. They'll kind of frown out and you'll see the, I'm sorry, I'm going to probably think, say a different scale, but the, not the labial scales, but right along the bottom of the jaw, they'll kind of start sagging out a little bit, and they'll kind of look like a pug is the best way okay. to put it. <laughs> um, when you start seeing that kind of pyramiding underneath the jaw, it's definitely an early warning sign at that point. Um, all of the times I've treated mouth rot, I think I've caught them relatively early, um, beta-soaked betadine Q-tip, and just really – 
any kind of abscess in there, make sure it got debrieved and rub that in there pretty good. Do that every four to five days. Um, in those issues, sometimes they'll stop eating. Sometimes they won't. Um, those that do stop eating just so they're not getting, because most all four times it was all slender species. I was always worried about them not maintaining weight. I would assist feed them on top of that. I think, um, if you do assist feed, that's also one of the times you're probably going to uh, counter it. If you scrape them with the tongs or anything like that, that you're using to feed, you got to be real careful not to cause any scratches in that. Cause I think that's another reason why you get it mostly in Boiga. Interesting. One thing, um, again, <clears throat> Zach and I, we always state, you know, we're, we're not veterinarians, but in terms of some of the preventative care and aspects about that, you know, you can also use um, a dilute solution of peroxide as well to clean out that area, but also um, it's typically sold for burn wounds, but um, antimicrobial silver wound gel, you can actually put some of that on the actual area and it prevents um, the growth of bacteria inside of a wound too as well. It is something that is very helpful. Um, and also even if you need to rinse the oral cavity of the snake, it is also helpful to use the peroxide, but also follow up. They typically sell it for people that have bad breath where they have dry mouth syndrome. Um, and you can actually rinse that in terms of the mouth too, as well. So just trying to provide some yeah. future thought of things to have on hand. I think you're, are you talking like silver sulfadine cream? Yes. That is, that is something that in issues where you can't take them to vets, that's the main reason why I've done anything with them. All my other snakes that I can take to vets, so anything that's non rear um, they go to the vet right away if I have any issues. But most of the vets down here um, think the closest one's four and a half hours away. That'll see venomous snakes, and people consider boiga false water cobras. They won't. I've had to use the word Brazilian smooth snake a few times to try to <laughs> <laughs> try to get somebody to see something um, just so I can get in there for, I think I've had mites once that I had to get some medication for because it caused some abscesses, but stuff like that. It's one of those. If you don't have to do it, don't do it. Um, hands off is always the better way to go about it. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that for a second. So the, the, Somebody that's part of the Marillion Python network, uh, Nipper Reed, uh, he's kept a lot of Boiga over in uh, England, and he's one of the few guests I've heard on a podcast. He was on um, the Herpticulture podcast with Jake and Justin, and he he talked a lot about um, this idea of willful neglect with Boiga. So essentially, you know, obviously we're not neglecting the snakes. That's not what's being said here. Um, I mean, if you're going to the lengths that you're going to, where we've got UVB, heat panels, pothos plants, substrate, freaking mist king system, that, you know, that's about as far away from neglect as you can get. But I've noticed that when I had my sienna, um, I just didn't touch them. Like, I got them set up. I got every other parameters to where they needed to be dialed in. And then the willful neglect comes into play where you basically – it's a look, but don't touch. I'm going to drop feed. I'm going to not really be in there mucking around. I'm not pulling them out to get this flipping Instagram picture because they're so dramatic, you know. Um, and it's more of a respect at a distance type of keeping over your more typical keeping. It. Do you agree that that might be the way to go with these guys or not so much? Or where, where do you fall on that particular idea? So I definitely agree, you know, for a keeper, it is definitely one of those admire from afar, watch their naturalistic behaviors, watch that cryptic basking, that movement. Um, I don't recommend live feeding. I've had to do it a few times for some wild caught animals, but watching that ambush hunting is always um, intriguing to watch. But unless you have a reason and a need, to have to get them out. That is not just, Hey, take a picture of this. Um, most of the time, if I have pictures, it's I'm doing a 
big cleaning in the cage to make sure there's not a just buildup of uh, urates or anything that don't get broken down. I'll take those pictures then and use that opportunity for that. But outside yeah. of that, it's not a it's not a ball python. It's not a corn snake. It's not a takeout every single day. And you know, I can go sit on my couch and watch. I look at Boyga as a species that you want to do your best to bring a piece of nature inside of your home and set it up and have this animal that you might see during the day here and there. You might see it perched out under the heat, kind of like a green tree, but most of the time you won't see this animal. It's that odd special occasion that you walk in and you see it moving around that makes them special to have, that makes them that's so much more fascinating to see that different behavior just happen every so often versus trying to force interaction and hands-on work with them when you don't have to. Yeah. Spot on, man. Yeah. That's what I figured out with them. Very cool. Okay. So we, we talked a bit about breeding already where basically the strategy is to hit them with a lot of water, probably rep, Locating a little monsoon or something to that effect. And then the birds <laughs> um, increasing feeding frequency, and then you get the breeding behavior. Um, when you get the eggs, let's talk a bit about incubating. So, like, what temperatures, anything special about incubation medium, standard issue incubation for most colubrid eggs, totally different. Where, where do you – what are your so, thoughts on that? And what species have you bred? Right now, the – I've only bred nigriceps and cynea, and then if we want to toss in the toxidryas, I've bled the bred the pulverenta a few times because those used to be lumped in with Bolega, just yeah. African species. Um, but the pulverenta, the nigriceps, relatively easy. I've had no issues. Um, about 85 degrees, 100 days for the pulverenta, nine, about 85 to 90 for the nigriceps. Um, I usually put a little bit of cypress malt, um, sphagnum moss on top just to kind of keep yep. that, but not soaking wet. Um, I've tried just leaving them inside, um, inside of water filled sim containers that did not work for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely been a little bit of plug and play for the incubation. That's where out of all the things I've had, I think the most issues, um, I've seen a lot of people have good success with just moist perlite. Go that way. I've done the hatch right that people use for crested geckos that kind of worked. Um, and then most people say keep that temperature standard, but if you can provide a night drop a little bit, I do think I've had better success with having a bit of a fluctuation with them hatching on their own versus me cutting eggs. Um, actually, the one that I have now, that clutch – I didn't know my incubator failed <laughs> and everything was running. I think it dropped down to about 70 degrees in there for about hmm. two weeks straight and oh, it ended up still hatching them. They hatched out on their own and actually got out of that enclosure after I makeshift an incubator up and found one in another enclosure of mine. Oh God, there you go. Yeah. So, when they, I know that one of the great joys of Boiga keeping is getting the little guys to eat. Uh, when when my clutch hatched, I was like, I don't have the time for this. Here, grad student, and I recruited my grad student Alec, and was like, Yeah, if you know, you take these and get these started. I know Jordan Russell. He had the strategy of of using mouse tails. Um, and basically feeding them tails until they turn over and eat on their own with the pinkies. And there was a whole big process there. I know other people don't like mouse tails um, because it is so intrusive when you're jumping a tail down a little snake's throat. Um, so I'm just curious what you've used uh, in, in, in the past and what kind of success you had. So I've used a couple different uh, methods, certain species like the nigriceps, you can start them on pinkies right away. Um, I assist feed them two or three times, and those ones seem, out of all the species I've worked with, the babies, those seem to transition over way, way easier than anything else. Um, so talk a little bit about how you're presenting the mouse to a nigriceps. Is this on tongs? Is it just drop fed? 
Are you tease feeding them till they get pissed off and grab it? Like, what, what's the approach? Um, usually for the first two times, I'll do a little bit of tease and just see if I can get them angry enough to latch on. Then sit still, don't move, and see. Sometimes uh-huh. you'll get them every once in a while. They'll it'll be inconsistent for the first few feedings of them taking it, dropping it, not saying I'm not doing this and running away. Um, but it's very straight, just tongue, tease them around. Obviously, I go in at night. Um, that's when I feed all my animals just because it's easier for me. But it's – I wouldn't just leave it in there unless you see them starting to take it consistently on their own. Um, not saying that's going to be a waste, but majority of the time you're going to come back and it's still going to be there. Um, so occasional assist feeding. Usually with them, though, within the first month, you'll get them eating on their own, um, in my experience. The Cynea, those ones are definitely a little bit more tricky. I have a colony of morning geckos that every so often, if I really need to and I don't want to sit there and force feed them, they're naturally lizard eaters as babies, and they will slurp up morning geckos, uh, stillborn crested geckos, any kind of small gecko you have, they will slurp them up. Um, on their own, live, dead, doesn't matter. Um, so... If you have that chance, I haven't tried the Repti Links. I just don't think they, they're they attracted to them, um, in my opinion. But I know a couple people have had success with those. Um, scenting is iffy. Um, for baby Cynodon and the Latifasciata, uh, baby quail, anytime... If you have a problem, feed it with Boega 90% of the time. If it's slightly bigger, try birds. Birds are like crack for every single species there is. There we go. Um, Dan, just curious. Have you ever tried, you know, in terms of some of these hatchlings, because they are so small, have you ever tried just quail legs? I I do. Um, So what I'll do, like when I have a lot of babies, when I have – and I have my smaller adults and like my crepolini and stuff, I'll end up chopping the legs off, cutting off the foot. So there's no, in case they do try to push it back out, it's not a yeah a risk for them. And those will actually go down super, super easily. You can kind of pull in a little bit of the innards with it. So you have a little bit more of a complete meal versus a rat tail, which is just sinew and, skin and bone mm-hmm. basically um and you kind of just leave a little bit of that angle and pop it in the side and just go whoop, and it goes straight down and usually at that size it's not a very large piece um it's enough for their muscles to kind of pull it down but it's not very easily regurgitated um so if you don't want to have to deal with that constantly pushing in back out in and out that seems like the best plan of action um, as long as you have something to give the rest of the quail to, it's so that way you're not wasting just legs and legs and legs. Cool. So, so there's quite a few options here. Have you ever done tails, or do you just try to stay away from the tails? I've done tails on occasion. It's not my favorite. It's more of a I don't have anything else that I can try right now. I'll do the tails from. The ones that I've done with tails, like the first set of babies I got with tails, it took a lot longer for them to start growing. Um, I don't have the data and the large sample size of showing proof of that, but the coil eggs and giving them, once they're big enough, to like the super like red hot pinkies, like really small ones, um, just slightly blanch them because when they're that small, they get really squishy really easy. Give yes, them they just. Dip them in just boiling hot water for like two seconds. It'll stiffen them up a little bit enough where when you're, if you have to assist feed them, it's not going to pop on you very easily. Um, over rat tail, like mouse tails and rat tails, I'll even prefer just giving a pinky head over giving them tails just because it has more mass to it. Sure. And then these little guys, what are they going into? So they've hatched out of an egg. 
Uh, do you keep the clutch together at all, or are you worried about them cannibalizing each other? Do, does each snake get its own little 8x8-inch viv? I've done both where in 12x12s, uh, 12 by 12 by 12 I've done three or four individuals at a time. Um, and more or less at that point, it's only when they're not feeding on their own. I'll keep them in that, and then after that, I'll start to isolate them. Um, if I don't have a large clutch, sometimes I think if I have like maybe four or five, I'll keep them individually right off the bat. But most times that I've had the Cynodon breed, it's a clutch of about 10, 10 to 12 eggs. I haven't had a small clutch, like a successful clutch at least. Um, and it's spread them out a little bit, maybe keep a, a one or two in a group of two, but those are the instances where I'm still assist feeding. I'm still checking on them almost daily, but I'm not not working them until it's time to to feed them. Gotcha. That's cool. Hey Dan, just to give people a perspective of these as fresh hatchlings, how big are these hatchlings? Um, for the Niger steps, you're looking at close to ten inches. For some bigger ones, they're smaller clutch size. Um, for me, it's only been two to three eggs at a time. The Sinea, you're looking at like seven, eight inches for a big one. I had a set of twins hatch out that were only four inches long. And they are so, skinny. <laughs> big head, narrow body. Yeah. But they definitely can take a little bit larger than a lot of people think. Um, I'm not saying go try to push a fuzzy or something down there, but a pinky head down a a newborn sinea isn't too much of an issue, in my opinion. Cool. So, Dan, hey. you know, talking about some of these in terms of care, temperature, feeding, is there a specific Boiga that might, if someone was interested in pursuing them, is there one that would be the better kept species as an introductory? For or introductory... Go ahead, sorry. No, it, you're good. Um, but, I mean, to, if someone wanted to get their Boiga craze going, you know, is there <laughs> is some one of these species that would be better suited for a new, newbie or a new keeper? For a, for fresh first Boiga, um, the four that are, like, most commonly bred, Melanota, Nigerceps, Cynodon, and the Cynea, um, Melanota, usually you should have no issue with them getting started. A lot of those guys start on their own. Um, they're a bit bigger baby. They get a little bit more feisty for a while. Um, I've seen people have them calm down, but I've also seen ones that are six to eight foot girthy. I think probably the girthiest Mel uh, Boiga species that I know of that will constantly want to just bite the crap out of you. Um, they start off real easy. The Niger steps, they start off a little smaller, but I think they acclimate very well and pretty easy going. So if you wanted to, as long as you're not constantly messing with it, because those ones, they don't really seem to rear up at all. It's more of just, I'm not dealing with this today, and you won't really see it until they decide to latch onto your finger. Um, yeah, they're... They're definitely mostly docile, but they're definitely one that those ones have, in my opinion, most like hemotoxic or most most reactions to their bites for the Niger steps, from my opinion, that I've seen. But they're also relatively common. Even the wild caught ones are relatively easy to get established. Um, Cynia are kind of in between not your first snake but if you have some experience with it i have i think they'd be very well easy and you watch that otogenic color change go from that bright green head to an orange body to that straight green with teal or yellow highlights is very intriguing to see the cynodont they're they start relatively easily they're they assist be probably the easiest out of all of them um even if they're like you're not familiar with assist feeding, as long as you don't let them just wiggle all around with their long, lanky little body, they're probably 
the easiest kind of introductory in there. And then I forgot about the Chemisincta. If you want a jet black snake that gets about six feet long, um, those ones I've always had that are a bit satanic. I don't think I've, I know it's Gemisincta that isn't satanic, but those ones are also kind of up there with the melanoda in terms of easiness and care and getting established. But those and, um, Sine, I haven't seen a wild caught Gemisincta or Sinea in years. So all the ones that you see, the babies are all captive bred. They might be imports, but they're usually one of your better points to start with. Um, Sign it on or getting more captive bread. They just take a really long time to incubate, like most Boyga. But I think just straight off the list, I'd go Melanota, Gemisinka, Nigerceps, Sinea, and then Sign it on. If I had to give them like a just quick list. Okay. Right. So you've alluded to this a couple times, but, and, I hope you want to talk about it. <laughs> we, I asked you, is there anything we don't talk about? So, but I know that you have an extremely special Boiga yeah. uh, that kind of had a little bit of internet fame there for a little while. Um, oh, she, she still gets love. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit of? It's a dendro, right? It is no, a melanota. Mel, mel, melanota. Sorry. Yeah. So, talk a little bit. And, and by the way, we keep saying dendro, dendro, melanota. Can you? Tell everybody what those are in common names. Um, so Dendro, Dendro, I still constantly say it twice because yep. Melanota and Dendrophila used to be under the name, but it's the Malaysian cat snake, which is Boiga Melanota, and then there is the Indonesian cat snake, which is uh, Boiga Dendrophila. I keep saying Dendro, Dendro because I was when I first started, and it's kind of ingrained with me now. They were still lumped together, and the Melanota were still in that complex of uh, dendrophila because a lot of those species like the latifasciata, I think were separated off the. Uh Oh, and this is when technology (laughs) does its best. If you are a avid listener, you know, we struggle with technology because Zach and I are old, but (laughs) old, old AF, but uh, it's frozen staring at the sky. Yeah. Oh, well, all right, Eric will fix this. <laughs> yeah, we could probably just leave it roll. I mean, for most of our mm-hmm. listeners, they're pretty understanding, and this yeah. is when we banter a little bit, and Dan signs back in, and mm-hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll re begin. Go ahead and hop back on. <laughs> and I'm getting the panic message, which is part of the course. We're at one hour, 27 minutes. I'm going to type that for Eric. <sighs> da, 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 da. You can see my messages. All right. We could be good. My back? You're back. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Oh, you don't have to apologize, man. You're back on and we're still recording. This is a freaking miracle. <laughs> Normally, it's at this point that there's a bunch of four-letter words, and uh, we have to throw this thing away. So we don't have to throw this one away. Okay. Awesome. So you were talking about Boiga dendrophila, dendrophila, Boiga. Now I'm getting them all. Malaysia. Okay, so Boiga dendrophila is yes. the Indonesian cat mangrove snake, and Boiga melanota is the... Malaysian mangrove snake look identical for the most part. Your banding is a little different. Um, it's like one scale wide versus two scale wide. It's complete rings around the body versus partially broken. Perfect. Um, cool. But the normal ones you have are banded the whole way down the body, vertical banding down the body. The, uh, the special one I have that's my profile picture still is a striped variant of melanota she has a racing stripe going from back of her cheek where they have that yellow jaw all the way down her body pretty much so so what's the origins of that animal like that did you find out about it 
And how did it end up getting into your collection? That animal, um, friend of mine that does a lot of importation, uh, was offered that animal along with some other oddball boyga that I could have afforded. I would have, but I just couldn't. Um, but I got a phone call at eight o'clock at night on a Friday and he was like, Hey, I got something coming in. And I'm like, okay, but you don't really call me very often. So this has got to be something a little funky. And I get pictures about two minutes later. And have you ever had that instance where you're like, I have no idea how I'm going to do this, but I have to do this. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have. At least once a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so during this phone call, it was, I got some normal ones coming in and then this, and I'm like, to put in perspective, you're looking at like, at the time from most of what I've seen is like for Malaysian Melanota, you're looking at like 350 to 500 for standard wild caught. I, I spit out a rather large number. Um, I don't know. If you're okay with me saying I, I spent two thousand dollars on that snake, just yeah, it's okay. Just not off, just off hinge. Just I'm gonna spit out a number and you tell me if you like this number or not. Is what I told him. And um, about four days later, she was in my collection. Uh, came in with some nasty nose rub, which you're gonna see with a lot of belega. They get put in yeah. belly cups and just not crappy, but they're not supposed to be in the importer for very long, so. They're in there. They don't really care, and it's going to come over. That is definitely a willful neglect. Just yep. make sure you don't see it getting worse, and just let it be. Let it shit out, and it will come back. It might not be perfect, but it will come back. Um, the recent pictures I just posted over the other day on my Instagram, you can you can still see there was some damage there, but it wasn't like a – wasn't like it was before with a, you know, probably dime sized scab on her nose. Mm -hmm. And then she's taken off and established. Uh, she, she took off frozen, like, like I said, Melanota, she took off frozen thaw left in right off the bat. Even with the nose rub, I think she missed like two or three meals when she was in shed. She won't touch birds, but she will take mice. Like it's her job. Uh, rats, it's occasional. If she'll touch those, uh, usually I have to fall out the rat in with the, uh, the mice. So it's not mm -hmm. overly scented. Cause I've, oddly enough, I've never used Dawn to wash my animals, like descenting or anything like that. I know it's a trick that some people use, but I've never used it. Wow. And now how long have you had her? I think it's been close to, like five, six months now that I've had her. Yeah. So well, she's we wish you luck. <laughs> With that. I'm hoping if her boyfriend picks up his act, he's been going on and off feet a little bit, but I think it's just cause we have been having a few low pressure systems. He might be reverting a little bit and I'm not ready to put them together yet. So it's like, hopefully he kind of pulls back after we get these systems out and probably Later this year, I might introduce them, but that is going to be so nerve wracking. Yeah. <laughs> she's about yeah. four and a half, five feet long, you know, good build to her and everything. That male is six and a half feet, um, same build. And I'm just worried that he might think she's a snack because they're both wild caught yeah. and they will eat snakes in the wild. So it's one of those leery situations that I'm going to be sitting there with the take off a couple of nights of work. Yep. I hear you. Well, very, very cool. Um, anything else you want to throw in to this conversation? Um, that we may not have touched on directly that you'd want the world to know about Boiga keeping and, and your animals and all that kind of good stuff. If I don't want to say just like an overall with the care they are a little bit hardier than people think. I'm not saying a corn snake or a carpet python, but you have, you have some room to play with in certain areas, but 
hydration is literally the one thing that you have to make sure you take care of, especially if you're dealing with wild caughts or babies, um, certain species of boiga that I can't even maintain. Um, my friend Chris over in Belgium, not Belgium, Netherlands, probably one of the only people I know that has boiga jaspidia that he's been able to keep alive long term, even get eggs from, but whenever they go in a shed, unless you're putting them basically in a water chamber, you're almost guaranteeing them to die because their shed will kill them. Really? It's they're so slender and that shed will constrict and fuse on. And it's just a compounding issue. It might not be the first shed, but it's just going to be a compounding issue that is almost impossible to fix because they're so sensitive. All right. Well, I think that you've done a clinic on Boiga today there, Dan. This has been fantastic. So our listeners that asked for Boiga, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, very, very cool. So what's the – well, well, Matt, why don't you ask the question you always ask about around this time in the episode? Do you know what I'm talking about? Because it's not on the outline. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean – <laughs> I'll, I'll ask it for you. So what do you think about the future of herpetoculture? I mean, you, you're you're a young guy, but you've been doing this a while. So, um, and I, I think that we pretty much came, I, I think that when I started hitting this really hard is around the time that you started hitting this really hard. Um, do you think we're heading in the right direction? Do you think we've stagnated? Uh, do you think we're divided? We're united? Just just talk a little bit, because the, the thing that you may, that the listeners may not know and I highly recommend that you listen to Project Herpetoculture's episode with both Dan and Stacy. Is that you know Dan's talking about Boeing and a bunch of snakes. Dan also, you know, is part of a team that keeps an awful lot of wonderfully obscure, beautiful species of lizards. Um, there's there's twice the amount of lizards in this house than there are snakes. Yeah, and he just said eighty snakes. So there you go. Uh, but well, just talk a little bit about your thoughts about the state of herpetoculture today and where it's heading in the future. And then uh, I have a follow-up question off of that for you, Dan, after that. Um, I think there is progress we're seeing. I don't know if it's just them coming back around because they've been on import lists before. Um, I am a firm believer of wild caught animals coming into the hobby. Certain species we don't need. I don't want to. I've been exposed to picking up boxes from the airport that have 600 gaboon vipers, puff adders, and rhino vipers. There's not 600 keepers in the United States that can handle those. Um, and that's not something that just happens once a year. That is three or four boxes that come in part of the shipment that comes in with Africa and everything like that. But those oddball species that are trickling in one at a time that are allowing people to that have that hyper fixation that want one or two animals that you don't see every day and seeing people breed these rare species is a positive and a growth that I see in the hobby. Um, but at the same time, I feel like the influencer crowd and everything is getting a little too big because people are just cycling out and they're kind of treating things like, oh, this is only for this amount of time to get me views, and as soon as it doesn't attract attention that they want, they cycle it out. And I'm not saying that we aren't cycling animals out that work well with us, that don't work well with us, but we're, we're almost at a crossroads where we need to pick whether we're going to unite and say, all right, we can have these influencers and everything, but I want to see them keep building on the same things that they have and keep growing with that because – nobody's learned everything we have of any species we hear, like not even ball pythons. People keep saying, oh, well, we, we know what we're doing with them. Same thing with corn snakes. You can still keep growing on them, just seeing the different habitats that they grow and flourish in, in different parts of the country in their range, just seeing that and trying to adapt that into keeping would be a wonderful way of seeing it. Basically multiple ways to skin a cat is the best way yep. to put it. Um, but there's definitely going to be, I think there's definitely going to be some issues coming up in a few years, especially in the venomous community. And I think 
the rear fang part of the hobby is probably the best compromise you could have to that if you wanted to get that while they kind of get lumped under the same regulation in some places it's most of these species aren't lethal unless you have a severe adverse reaction and you don't have you can show them off a little bit without risking somebody's life it's kind of why i've bleh, can't speak right now um just gravitated towards them um my city ordinances don't allow me to have venomous but they have no issues with me keeping belega uh, or the false water cobras or the madagascan giant hog nose so that's where make that compromise sometimes where people are like oh i want to run a viper because it looks so cool I have snakes that look way cooler that I can handle when I need to without risking my life and, you know, or somebody else's life if they get out of my house. Um, so it's, I think we're moving in a, a good direction, but we're definitely sitting on a, a fine line. Sorry. Okay. No, all good. No, you uh, you started to go in what I was going to use as a follow-up question related to rear fang species um, because it, it's going to become a very tricky aspect, you know, going forward in, in the future because it is a gray area within keeping because they are still considered a venomous species, you know, in the, the eyes of the law, um, especially even when you look at certain states and how shipping procedures are. I mean, you're going to see a lot of law changes that do affect rear fang species as it relates to shipping animals too, as well. Um, so it will be very interesting to see how things progress in, in the keeping of rear fanged animals, especially. Yeah. I think some of those regulations I've, cause I've, I have issues trying to certain people want to buy certain animals, even some of the false water cobras that mm -hmm. Zach traded me that I was trying to move. It was city. Like you get conflicting information because of old regulations and new regulations coming in. It's definitely something that you have to pay attention to. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen people kind of fall under the radar because they don't even know what a Belega is when you call them. Cause I've called, I've called a couple of different state game agencies because they're the ones that regulate it. And they're like, well, what? Um, and I'm like, well, at that point, it's, I don't, I usually decline the sale, but I also try to educate people. I've had somebody that, you know, is like, well, I can, I have one already. I'm like, well, you're not supposed to have one already. I'm not going to say anything to you, but you're not following the proper regulations. And you doing that, while you might not think it's a big deal, it's just creating ammunition for somebody down the line that's fear mongering away from what we have because somebody's going to let something get loose by accident and not have that mindset of, Hey, I didn't prepare for this properly in the first place. So I'm not going to say anything. And then next thing you know, we have somebody getting bit by a zebra co zebra spitter or yeah. an Egyptian snouted cobra getting loose at a reptile expo that was not supposed to be allowed out and supposed to be in double containment and was just sitting in a deli cup on a table. Yeah. Or a static Cobra ending up in a trailer park in Morgantown, West Virginia. And then the DNR guy sending me a picture of it and saying, is this dangerous? <laughs> I was like, Holy Christ. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, that's dangerous. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, no, that happened. Yeah. Hmm. I think no, well we, said, Dan. <laughs> I think the biggest thing that we probably need to work on as a hobby is better policing wow. of our own of ourselves at shows. Uh -huh. I'm in PA. It is the wild wild, wild west, west here. Yep. I know I walk into Hamburg, I can walk into Oaks, I can walk in <laughs> Pittsburgh, Carlisle, any of those shows and I can guarantee you I'm going to see at least six alligators. It's not an entire 10 gallon full of baby alligators. <laughs> the last show I went to, I saw saltwater crocodiles at a show. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Why? I need at why? least three of those. Yeah, why? <laughs> <laughs> that is ridiculous. It completely. 
unnecessary. Like myself, I would love to have a Cayman, mm-hmm. but I know, I know that right now is not the time. Mm-hmm. If I can make the space, and I'm jealous of Zach gets to have one, but he also has. Well, I don't get to have one. I have a freaking school, so yes, you, you know the, that's the only reason why I get to work with a Cayman is. Yes, but. it's. I think we all have to kind of maintain that idea of. I might want something, and I know a lot of talk, shows have talked about, you know, impulse control and not – don't buy it the first day you see it. Come home, look it over, research it, see – you might look at what you need for it now, but you need to look at what you need from it six months, two years from now, not today. Because you're looking at it today because you're trying to justify your weight so you can bring it home the first time you see it. And this is coming from somebody that has done it plenty of times when I first started out and I had a whole bunch of different animals cycle through my collection because I was like, I can't keep this. It's going to get too big. And it's because I only looked at the here and now and I didn't look at that six months down the line. Yep. And I think that is a perfect way to end the episode on Boiga. So excellent job, Dan. This was fun. We'll have to have you back on for some of those other critters that you have. Um, so if people want to find you, they want to find you and Stacy's, uh, you know, herpetoculture, uh, company or effort or whatever you want to call it, uh, where, how do people find you and where do they go? Uh, Facebook's the easiest way. It's got a link tree that'll send you to our Instagram. Um, I don't post very much on my personal Instagram, but, um, if you look up roots, scoots, roots, underscore scoots, underscore N underscore scales, um, you'll find the tag of, is a collaborator on a lot of the posts for, uh, I might keep rear fangs underscore 26, <laughs> uh, which is my private, mm-hmm. uh, Instagram, but that's where a lot of it is. Um, feel free to reach out with any questions right now. I don't have anything for sale that is Boyega related, but hopefully this year I'll have some babies that I can send out to some new homes. Um, but if anybody has any questions, please feel free to answer. Free to reach out. We and you can find me, Doctor Crawdad, on Instagram, Zach Loafman on Facebook, and you know it is my obligatory time to talk about graduate education at West Liberty University. Um, always looking for good graduate students. In fact, I'm I'm hopping off here and then I'm up at school because that's where I record and I'm calling a potential graduate student immediately after this. So, uh, yeah, good things going on that front. And then, Matt, where can people find you? You can find me on Sarpamitra, both on Facebook and Instagram. Okay. So this has been, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that this is, we never say this, um, this is episode number 28. We're pushing 30, so pretty soon we'll hit another decade of episodes. Uh, And... I would be remiss if I didn't thank the Marilia Python Network and all the hard work that Eric does uh, to enable us to do this and to have the other uh, podcasts that we are proud to be co-podcasts with, with that particular, with NPR. Um, And with that being said, thank you all. Have a great morning, afternoon, uh, evening, night, whatever time you're listening to this. I hope it's a good one. Bye. Bye.